right, so welcome everybody to our third uh, LEL research seminar. Uh, this is the first time I think in 20 months that we actually have a speaker here in person, so it's quite a milestone, very happy that it worked out in the end. And as always, after this, we're going to have a wine reception in the common room. So everybody, when this is done, just follow me over to the common room and we will you know, chat and drink <coughs> And now I give the word to Pat, who is going to say some words about our speaker for today. Thanks, Richard. It's an absolute delight to, to introduce today's speaker, so Dr. Eleanor Shadow, joining us from the University of York. And I'm double delighted because Eleanor was uh, scheduled to speak here in March 2020, and uh, for obvious reasons, this didn't happen. But it feels quite monumental that we're back and we've got her in person. So, you know, there's a sense of uh, that things being back to normal. And uh, Elena, like I said, is uh, working at the University of York, which is a lecturer in financial technology. She obtained an undergraduate degree from New York University, followed by a PhD from Hopkins University. And then uh, she spent uh, two years working at Northwestern as a postdoc, and she's been working in New York uh, for well over two years now. So this, she's in her third year. And uh, so, as uh, I mean, Elena has done lots of exciting work on lots of kinds of different projects, lots of different interpretation of phonetic stuff, uh, cross linguistic stuff. But uh, I think it's fair to describe her kind of main set of research interests as uh, phonetic uniformity. And uh, we're going to talk to her more about this today. But uh, I've seen that she's got a um, uh, paper recently accepted in language on this general topic, which is uh, not too bad. And uh, apart from language, she's also published in Journal of Phonetics, Journal of the Episcopal Society of America. Um, so, yes, over to you, Eleanor. Thank you very much for coming. And please welcome Joey, everyone, and welcome Eleanor to uh, our summit. Thank you, Pat, for that really kind intro. Um, I am also very excited to be here in person as we last left off. It was, uh, well, let's wait and see. So this was March 2020. And uh, yeah, that uh, of course has now transitioned into the pandemic, but I'm so glad that we're back in person. Um, so I'll be talking on structure and cross linguistic phonetic realization. And a lot of what I'll be talking about today was in some of those articles that Pat mentioned earlier. Um, so we'll start off with the big question which sort of stands at the core of many linguistic inquiries, which is what are the range and limits of cross-linguistic variation? Um, and people might have different terms for describing these phenomena. You might call them linguistic universals, maybe universals, too strong a word of a word. So maybe you'd say cross-linguistic generalizations or tendencies. Whatever this is, what we want to know is what these generally reveal about the structure of the grammar, and specifically the structure of the grammar in the mind of the speaker. So when something's cross-linguistically common, what does that mean about the language, the linguistic grammar? So some common cross-linguistic generalizations from other areas of linguistics that we I'll be talking about um, are ones like in syntax when a demonstrative numeral and sort of adjective precede a noun, they are always found in that order. If they follow, the order is reversed. So that's a Greenberg universal. Um, another Greenberg universal from morphology, no language has trial number unless it also has a dual. No language has a dual unless it has a plural. Um, so cross-linguistically, the pattern. And in phonology, we might come to, the we might draw the universal that almost no language has voice stops without also having voiceless stops. I think there are yeah, there are about four out of 706 that have been identified to just have voice stops and not have voiceless ones. So as I, as I said earlier, it's less about what we should call these generalizations, whether it's a universal or just a typological tendency, but it's more about the fact that these observations potentially reveal constraints on syntactic variation, morphological variation, phonological variation, and so forth. So in other words, the structure of linguistic systems. So now my question is, well, what about phonetic variation? What are the constraints on that cross linguistically? To look at this question, um, we first need to sort of come up with a framework or commit to some framework of thinking about how phonetic, phonetic uh, variation is generated. Um, so I'm going to adopt this very traditional but not entirely uncontroversial representation of phonetic realization. Um, so how we get from the linguistic grammar, the mind of the speaker, to something observable in the physical world. Um, so I'm going to assume a phonological surface segment uh, that is then realized, and this 
I'll call this phonetic implementation or phonetic realization as a set of abstract phonetic targets. And these might be perceptual motor in nature. This is still sort of something we've got to figure out, but we'll, we'll be making some assumptions about what these phonetic targets are. Those are then sent, to the arti sent through articulation, physically articulated, which then results in a physical acoustic form. So to dive into this a little bit more, we can take a specific example of, say, the surface uh, phonological segment of aspirated K. Um, and so we might think of this in really traditional chomsky howley sort of ways as, okay, K is composed of a set of distinctive features. These might be structured in some way, um, perhaps not. In any case, K has constituent features to it. These are then realized as a set of abstract phonetic targets where you might think that the phonetic targets could be something like there needs to be a constriction made at the velum or with the, door, the tongue dorsum. And perhaps there's a glottal spreading gesture of some sort, and there's some timing relationship between the two. Now, of course, there is there are core, there is a relationship, of course, between what's going on in the phonetic targets and what the parts of the phonological representation are, right? So phon phonology says there should be a dorsal gesture or something done with the tongue dorsum. There should be something with plus spread buzz, but the phonological component says nothing about the precise phonetic realization, like how long should I spread the glottis? How long should I have the tongue dorsum make the constriction? How do I time those two relative to one another? So the phonology doesn't really give any indication to those details of how the target should, of how the sound should be realized. That comes in the phonetic targets. So there's a lot of room for variation effectively in between the phonological uh, representation and the corresponding, corresponding phonetic targets. If we want to understand the font, this mapping, this interface, well, what we have to work with is we don't have direct access to the phonetic targets. So we might look at something like the articulation or the acoustics to infer what's going on in the phonetic targets. One common acoustic instantiation of, say, level spreading might be the voice onset time. So what is the duration from the stop release to the onset of voicing that correlates with how long flawless has been spread and its timing relative to the constriction? Okay, so it's not a direct measure of perhaps the target, but it is a proxy for what's going on in the phonetic targets. So we look at phonetic variation in voice onset time of aspirated stop consonants. Um, well, let's look at K first, which is our example. We see that there's a lot of variation in the talker mean voice onset time. So this is, um, this is a histogram of the talker mean VOTs 4K from 180 speakers of American English uh, in the mixer six corpus. The mean is at about 56, but you can see some speakers have means less than 40 milliseconds. Others are way up towards 80 milliseconds. So there is absolutely variation in that mapping from the phonological representation to the phonetic targets. So how long should the glottis be spread? If we extend this now to P and T, we see there's also a lot of variation in voice onset time for these other stop consonants that have slightly different phonological representations. So for P, some talkers are down at about 30 milliseconds, others definitely up at 80 milliseconds. T ranges from about 40 milliseconds to almost 100 milliseconds long in VOT. So there's a lot of variation. So now we need to think about, okay, so there, there is variation in how individual speakers are taking, are mapping the phonetic targets to the phonological representation or how the uh, phonological representation is being instantiated or realized uh, into the set of phonetic targets. So we can think about, so, so the next question now is, are speakers free to choose this mapping how in whatever way they want? Um, and one idea that might suggest that maybe speakers are free to choose the mapping uh, from the phono phonological representation of phonetic ones is an idea of linguistic bricolage. So this comes from sociolinguistics, where speakers can pick and choose their phonetic targets or linguistic, uh, linguistic instantiations to convey their social identity. Um, 
So this might be useful for constructing a persona of like, you know, I want my P to sound very much like this group of people and my K to sound like this group of people. And it would be really useful if this is true, it would be very useful for talker recognition that you can pick and choose how you want to express each individual phonological segment. So a hypothetical scenario, if this is true, is that talker one could choose a VOT of 60 milliseconds for P, 80 for T, 90 for K, and this is actually a pretty common pattern across linguistically, at least the ranking. Talker two though might say, I want my T to be really long because you know some group, some identity has very long VOTs and I just want T to represent that, but I want P and K to represent some other group. And talker three might have some other uh, independent realization. They just pick and choose these targets of VOT. If speakers can pick and choose their targets independently of one another, then we would expect a relationship of talker means between phonological segments like this. So what we have here are, this is a hypothetical scenario. Each point is a pair of talker-specific means, for example, P and T, okay? So the relationship between the VOT for P has nothing to do with the VOT for T, right? Because you can independently choose those. The actual data looks more like this, right? It is very structured that whatever your VOT is for K is highly indicative of your VOT for P and T, suggesting maybe you can't pick and choose everything. So there is com uh, considerable evidence that a fair amount of structure still exists. It's not a total free for all in how you map the phonological segments to their phonetic realization. There are constraints. Um, and one motivation, so it could be that the other end of the continuum is that there could be maximal structure, that everything has to be correlated within a population of speakers. And there's actually good reason to think that maybe you do want really tight structure among all of the phonological segments in terms of their phonetic realization. So um, speech perception frequently assumes that there is maximal structure between the uh, phonological segments. So, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the chart on the left, or I guess on our right here. This is um, from Miri and Osman's sliding template of vowel normalization. And what we have is the template of vowels in log F1, F2 space. And the idea is that, is that the template of vowel relationships in the F1, F2 space is consistent across talkers. So when you go to adapt to a new talker, if you hear, say, their E, then all you have to do is shift the template up for that E and suddenly you've filled in the rest of the space. So that assumes perfect code variation among all the vowels. So, and so perfect structure would actually make life a breeze for speaker adaptation. Okay, so there's really good motivation to make sure everything is really systematic. So what we observe from the voice onset time aspirated stop example, is that we are observing a high, a high degree of structure in this case, indicating that there's something constraining at least the phonetic realization of these three segments. Um, and perhaps it's obvious to you what that is, but we're going to explore that a little bit more today. So of course, is, is maximal structure the answer to this? Is everything correlated? Is it that straightforward that you know, whatever you choose for P, VOT is going to constrain every other phonetic realization. Um, so do we observe perfect structure across all talkers? The answer to this is probably not. And I think you might be able to think of examples where you may not get perfect structure. We're going to look at some today. So in considering this problem of variation and systematicity, what we want to ask are, what are the constraints that govern the projection of phonological segments into a phonetic space. So they're phonetic targets. And on the one extreme, we have maximal phonetic bricolage, which we've already shown doesn't exist in its extreme form, but we can think of it as sort of an endpoint. And on the other hand, on the other side, we have maximal phonetic structure, which is that everything is correlated. Maybe it just has to do with the fact that it's all coming out of the same vocal tract. But what we'll see is the answer is probably somewhere in between. So, our, so what we'll do today is try to figure out what that in-between set of constraints might be. So yes, today we'll be looking at what are the constraints on phonetic implantation or realization that give rise to co-variation across talkers, like what we saw with VOT. 
How well do these constraints account for patterns of co-variation among phonological segments? And how broadly do these constraints apply? Are they language specific? Or might we start to say, maybe there's a universal influence of this constraint? So um, first, I'm going to go through the constraints that we'll be looking at today, which are all in this umbrella of uniformity. Then we'll look at some case studies from sibilant fricatives. And um, if we have time, go into some cross stalker and cross linguistic extensions of this. So the three constraints I'll be talking about today are pattern uniformity, and sort of sub-constraints of those are target uniformity and contrast uniformity. We'll be looking at four phonological surface segments, um, and we'll first be looking at American English and then also look at Czech. Um, both languages have, to varying degrees, these four segments. Zha is a bit marginal in, in English, but it is present. Um, and right here, I've got the, um, as I'm going to assume that it has something like this set of features. Uh, the key thing to this set of distinctive features is that sa and za share a feature value for the place of articulation specification, and sha and ja are share a value for the, for the place of articulation specification. I'll be using the feature anterior to describe this. You could replace it with the feature cat, um, as long as it's plus cat for s and z and minus cat for s and edge, and it probably should have something to do with the place of articulation. Um, the corresponding phonetic targets for these uh, fricatives might be something like the constriction location, perhaps specified in coordinates uh, in the mouth, you know, what is the constriction width, is the glottis open, and so forth. Um, so the first constraint, uh, so yes, we're going to be looking at specifically the relationship between the anterior realization and probably something like constriction location, but in a acoustic form, which we'll get to in a bit. So first, the constraints. Um, pattern uniformity. This is the maximal phonetic structure constraint. Okay, we haven't ruled this one out yet, and we might need to. Um, so pattern uniformity is the idea that the relations among phonetic targets for different sounds should be the same across speakers of a given language. Okay, so this is the idea that you should be, you should, you can differ in the absolute value, of course, like our vocal tracks differ, but the template of sibilant fricatives should be the same. It's okay. What this allows, though, is that it's okay if the place of articulation for S and Z is a little bit different, okay? As long as it's the same difference across people, okay? So the template just needs to be the same. All right, so basically there's a yoke tying these four um, tying the phonetic realization of these four fricatives together. Okay, so however S, however, whatever the relationship is, it just needs to move it together. So match the population. That said, the relationship, this is a pretty high level relationship and it might be a bit too broad. Um, so the way that I've stated it, it could almost mean that your entire phonetic inventory or phonological inventory needs to be projected into phonetic space identically for, for every single talker. It, the only thing that can differ is the absolute value or the absolute value of it. Um, and it could be that an aspect of the segment is more important than the whole thing, right? So right now I'm treating each segment as its own independent entity. And it could actually be that only a piece of the segment really matters, like a feature. Um, so this is where target and contrast uniformity come in. They, constrain parts of the segment more so than the entire segment, okay? So target uniformity says that within the phonetic grammar of an individual talker, the phonetic targets corresponding to a phonological feature value are ideally identical for segments that are specified with that feature value. So this actually has a really intuitive um, background to it and actually has been sort of formulated in previous uh, proposals. Actually, it has been, so it's very much related to gestural economy principles, where you should have the exact same, you should just reuse the gesture for sa as for sa, and same for sha and sha. And um, Lenore Schwartz and, some, and Oven, I think, also formulated something similar, where you reuse gestures when you can. And so this fits in with target uniformity, which is 
the intuitive idea of, well, whatever your place of articulation is for S, whatever that phonetic target is, make it the same for Z. Um, so, but how, how much does that buy us? Contrast uniformity taps into the, you know, the dominance of contrast in linguistics, that there's something special about contrast. Uh, there's perhaps pre-existing evidence suggesting that this may not be a strong constraint, but we're going to test it regardless. Um, so contrast uniformity is that across talkers, the differences of phonetic targets corresponding to different values of the feature, holding all other features constant or ideally identical. Okay, so this is just saying that the, the constriction location difference between su and su, or sorry, between su and sha, right, should be the same across talkers. Now, you might be able to think of some literature that suggests that that contrast varies across speakers, which is what we'll ultimately see. But maybe there is some constraint that says, keep the contrast about the same, okay? All right, so just displaying the phonetic realization process again. We've got the, so S is plus the anterior minus voice. This is our surface segment. This is going to phonetically realized into a set of phonetic targets and then sent out for articulation at the corresponding acoustics. We need an acoustic, of course, we don't have access to the phonetic targets directly. We need an acoustic phonetic correlate of, say, constriction location, which should be very representative of the plus anterior feature. Um, what I'm going to use for this is the mid-frequency peak. Um, this is Broadly speaking, the peak frequency between 3,000 and 7,000 hertz for sa and za, and between 2,000 and 6,000 hertz for sha and zha. Um, we did develop a slightly more refined measure of it that is not place is not place dependent, but effectively it is the first peak frequency above any voicing effects in the spectrum, and this is supposed to be highly indicative of the front cavity resonance of sibilants, okay? So this should correlate approximately with the constriction location, okay? So if you think about where you're producing su, the, how the air is hitting the teeth is going to then create a resonance, will create this peak resonance um, and indicate the distance. Uh, so we have an, a metric basically that will, a measure that will try and pull this peak out we do not want, say, the first peak, which is maybe over here, that's due to voicing, and obviously not what we want. We want place, place of the constriction location. Okay, so moving into the data. So for this talk, I'm going to be using correlations of talker means as a proxy for structure. So the idea, I am happy to discuss other ways that I've investigated this because there are, um, many shortcomings with using correlations, um, but for clarity, if something strongly correlated, there's probably underlying structure to it. Um, so pattern uniformity predicts that there should be strong correlations of talker mean peak frequency among all four sibling categories, right? That's the idea of the template, everything's moving together and shifting together. So we should just get perfect correlations across the board. So the talker has a high peak frequency for some, they should have high peak frequencies for all their sibilants. Okay. Target uniformity makes the sub prediction that strong correlations of talker mean peak frequency should really only occur between home organic sibilants. Okay, so that says that only, we should only observe correlations between su and za in the mean frequency. So we look across a wide range of talkers just between su and za, but not between su and sha. Does that make sense? Okay. Contrast uniformity fills in this puzzle here, and this is where the correlation analysis is a little not great. Um, contrast uniformity predicts that we should only get strong correlations of talker mean peak frequency between heterogenic sibilants, so contrasting in place of articulation. So if you have both target and contrast uniformity, you get pattern uniformity for free. The big difference is that target uniformity puts the additional stipulation um, in place that the targets should be identical, not just correlated, but actually underlyingly the same. Um, this is hard to see in the correlation, right? Because you can have two things that are different but still correlated. Um, you're going to have to take my word for it, having done some additional tests. And 
there's a line of identity that you'll see the points fall close to, but I'm happy to talk about additional analyses further in the discussion. Okay, so we're going to start off with the Buckeye Corpus of Spontaneous Speech. Um, 40 native uh, top speakers of American English, nicely balanced in demographics. Um, it, is spontaneous, it is spontaneous speech. So it is only sampled at 16,000 hertz, and if you work with fricatives, especially sibilants at all, you might be thinking, that's way too low for sibilants. But remember, because a lot of, a lot of the energy for sibilants is above 8,000 hertz, but remember, we're dealing with this special peak frequency, which nicely gets us out of this. So, so the peak frequency will, by definition, be below 7,000 hertz. In total, we have um, just under 18,000 sibilants in the spectral analysis and about 470 sibilants per talker. There is not as many jazz as one might, one might like, but enough to get a mean out of it. So if we just look right here, I've got the histograms of talker mean mid-peak frequencies in ERV, so this is another twist on it. Um, we've worked it to ERV to sort of provide a nice, like, now we've got the perceptual and motor parts of it. Um, but what, what I want you to focus on is not the absolute number, but just the spread of variation in the data, that there, there is a fair amount of spread um, in the talker means. We look at the relationships between talker mean peak frequencies, though, you can see that when the sibilants share a phonological place of articulation, then indeed the phonetic realization is also highly similar. So they are correlated to an extremely high degree. So here we've got talk, uh, pairs of talker means in the center of the ellipses, and it's a fifth of the talker mean standard deviation of the ellipses spread out to. Um, and not only are the talker means highly correlated, say, between sa and za, but what you can see is that the best fit line is also almost entirely on top of the line of identity. So the one going through zero there, right? So just through the diagonal. And we get a very similar picture for sha and zha. Even though zha is not all that frequent in English, we're still getting that same strong relationship, though a slightly weaker, but 0.77 is not so bad of correlation. Okay, so this is a prediction, target uniformity predicts this should happen, okay? And a pretty straightforward interpretation that, hey, if they share a feature, you should realize, phonetically realize, those two segments in the same way. When we switch over to the contrasting anterior values, the correlations fall apart. Um, except for, I'm not entirely sure what's going on with the male speakers here, but we've replicated this in a couple of data sets and that is slightly anomalous. Um, by and large, the correlations fall apart. They are not significant. Um, and there's very little relationship between the constriction location, say, for S and a talker's constriction, constriction location for SHA. Okay, so if you know how a talker produces SHA, you may not, you might be able to put like a limit on where their SHA um, constriction location should be, but you won't have as good of a guess as you would with predicting SHA. Okay, so it's not what this is saying is not that contrast uniformity is not present. It could still have some small influence, saying like you know the contrast should be within this range. But at the very least, we can conclude that target uniformity has much stronger influence on that projection than contrast uniformity does. And so yeah, some of our more recent work is looking at well, contrast uniformity doesn't have a non, it's not a non-zero role. I think I got the negation there. It has a minor, like it is a measurable influence on the uh, phonetic realization. It's just not very strong, okay? So it's not that you can pick and choose any old value in the world. And that's probably subject to vocal track constraints. Okay, so now we're going to move on from American English to Czech. So it could just be that this um, really strong structure is specific to English. Um, do we know that it transfers just as well to another language in the world? Um, so I have chosen Czech in part because I speak Czech and was interested in looking at Czech some more. Um, and Czech also has the nice full place by voice contrast in sibilants with many words of each uh, containing those sibilants. So unlike English, zha is nicely represented in Czech. So we have uh, native words beginning with all four sibilants, and a multi-talker corpus was available. So specifically the nine-megan corpus of casual Czech 
So this has 60 native Czech speakers from the Prague and Central Bohemian region. Um, also nicely balanced in term, terms of demographics, uh, though on the younger side. 30 hours of speech and about 52,000 siblings for analysis, so many more than the American English one. Uh, and a median of about 800 siblings for a talker. And this was then, we, we actually forced to line this um, before the Montreal forced to line it. This is kind of how old the work is. Before the Montreal forced to line it allowed you to do this. So we did this with Caldi and built a G2P script. It was a lot of fun doing it. But we have some really nice alignments of the Torpus. Um, and unfortunately, these are a little bit harder to read, but we've got the same general idea of the pictures going on here, where we're looking at the pairs of talker mean peak frequencies between home organic sibilants. Um, so sa and za on the left-hand side and sha and sha on the right-hand side, coded for gender because um, gender also has a not trivial effect on the absolute value of the phonetic realization. So we've got a slight five modality there. But you can see the correlations are all above 0.79, very strong. And while I haven't drawn the line of identity, you can, you can visually perhaps imagine it um, straight through the two corners of the plot here. And you can see that they are very close to being on that line of identity. When we turn over to siblings contrasting in anteriority, again, the picture looks identical, very similar to English, where the correlations just fall apart. If you hear esh, and you can infer the constriction location, good luck predicting S, okay? It's still going to be wide variance there. Okay, so the patterns of co-variation are, I actually didn't show this data up here, but it's not necessary, it's not limited to speaking style. We do also have data from, labor from laboratory speech that looks identical, um, and it's not limited to American English. So this is evidence, at the very least, we can say this is strong evidence for target uniformity, but Minimal evidence for contrast uniformity, not much going on there. Um, but in some of our later work, we have shown, okay, it's still kind of there, just not strong. So one common objection at this point is uh, that perhaps we get the correlations because it's the same anatomy that's producing it, right? Well, this is a reasonable objection because S and Z are coming from this uh, vocal tract, so they would co-vary. But why then don't you get the covariation between S and S, right? It's still the same vocal tract, you would predict covariation. Um, so that's one argument that it's not just about it coming from the same vocal tract. Otherwise, you would predict perfect correlations everywhere. The other piece of evidence comes from sociolinguistic and cross-linguistic variation. We know that S varies a lot depending on social groups, suggesting that speakers have some amount of control in terms of how they want to articulate or, you know, what their phonetic targets are for S. So why not, again, this is the idea of the linguistic bricolage. You do have some control over S, meaning you also have some control over Z. Why not just make them different? So there's something yoking those two together that transcends uh, sociolinguistic choice. And also bilingual variation. There have been some studies, uh, less so for siblings, much more so for vowels, suggesting that you can have what you might call the same phonological segment, two languages, though I know that's a controversial statement, but being articulated in two different ways by the same person, okay? So you might have, uh, um, so I think Dutch and English, uh, one, I think Dutch has a slightly more retracted S than English does, and so a bilingual speaker could potentially have a retracted S for Dutch, but when they're speaking English, actually have it be more anterior. And I think that actually has been tested and shown, but I'd have to double check. But I do know those two languages differ in their S. Okay, so as a constraint on phonetic realization, at least target uniformity should extend to other languages, other populations, and other phonetic dimensions and segments. These are, after all, positive as constraints on the phonetics phonology interface, which should be you know, common in some abstract form across speakers. So now, if eh, we're gonna, oh, we're gonna final time. So now we're gonna move to cross talker and cross linguistic extensions of some of this work. Um, so previous, so specifically, actually, I think I'm gonna focus more on the cross linguistic ones here. Um, I'm really interested at this point in moving this research to more languages to see. I, I would really like to see cases where perhaps 
uniformity might break down a bit more or just seeing you know how strong is this uh so previous cross linguistic phonetic analyses have been somewhat limited to a small-ish number of languages with available data um or have relied on previously reported measures from the literature uh, this is in large part because of, you know, natural computational limitations that have existed and the fact that especially spoken data is really large and unwieldy and it's just really hard to work with and it hasn't been until recently that we've had the computational tools and computational storage and power to process it. So I think now is like the time is right for us to start doing more cross linguistic phonetic analyses, sort of syntax and all of them. All of the other fields we were working with text data could do this a while ago. Now we finally have the tools to do this with phonetic data. Um, and the availability of suitable multilingual speech <coughs> is increasing. But yeah, this has been a pretty recent development. The two corpora that I'll be that I have been looking at are from like 2019 and 2020. Um, so I'll be showing the one from 2019 today. But first, I'm also going to do what others did before me back. Uh, which is just to do a meta-analysis of the literature, right? If um, there are a few, a handful of phonetic measurements that everyone and their brother measures, um, and perhaps, and so we can comb through lots and lots of theses and articles to collect, say, previous voice onset time measurements or F0 measurements to try and get an understanding of crossing the six variation and structure. So just as a reminder, this is, um, so we're going to turn to VOT again. Um, and voice on, so American English voice onset time have this really nice structure to it. Uh, this is among the aspirated stops. Uh, I guess what I'm not presenting is the not as nice structure between the unaspirated stops, which I'll go into perhaps a little bit here. But when we have nice variation um, in the phonetic realization, we do observe the structure. And the target uniformity explanation for this, so circling back to the beginning of the talk, is that, of course, PT and K all share the region plus red box, right? They all have that in common. If you make that assumption that they are part of the same natural class and there is some representation that is tying them together, okay? I'm going to call that representation a distinctive feature value, but you can call that representation something else and I think the argument still holds. Um, so the phonetic targets for plus red gloss may include the uh, global spreading gesture, its duration, and its timing relative to the uh, oral constriction. And uniformity is basically saying the, spec the specification of the phonetic targets for pa ta pa must be uniform. Covariation of VOT arises due to underlying identity in the targets, right? So if you think about VOT, and if you're familiar with VOT, you might object at this point, say, but VOT differs across places of articulation. But the glottal spreading gesture and its timing relative to the oral constriction does not differ, okay? It is just because of the differences in the time, in the intraoral pressure that need to, or the differences in the timing it takes to reach a high enough intraoral pressure differ, okay? But, so that part, you could also phrase this, the intraoral pressure needs to be the same. So the time of, the intraoral pressure, the time of release needs to be the same, um, and that's the phonetic target. And when you do that, you get a slight difference in VOT. So moving into the cross-linguistic domain, um, we conducted a meta-analysis of the literature where we simply combed through as many theses and papers and grammars and so forth as we could. Um, and we were able to collect VOT data from, so it's all adult speakers from languages that have at least two places of articulation within a laryngeal series. And we're looking at all laryngeal series. So not just aspirated stops, but also unaspirated and even voiced. Okay, so we broke it up into calling them long lag, short lag, and lead. I don't know if we'll have, if I'll go into much detail here, but I'd be happy to in the discussion. Um, but all, overall, we have 36 language families, 147 language varieties, and over 50, so 1,700 data points. Um, and the correlations are really beautiful. Uh, so this is, again, the pairs of language-specific means between places of articulation. Um, but we're cheating a little bit here because what you can see is we've actually got three modalities. Uh, we have, so this is VOT in milliseconds and on the, so on the 
left-hand side, of course, we've got lead voice saying in the middle are the unaspirated, uh, the short lag, and on the right-hand side are the uh, long lag stops. Um, but also, you can just see, but nevertheless, there is really strong structure. The structure uh, is still strong when you look at the, especially the long lag stops and the lead stops. It breaks down a little bit with the unaspirated ones, but you can see that they still fit the overall pattern. The reason that the correlations may not be as high for the unaspirated stops could be due to the fact that by definition, they have a truncated range and you can't observe co-variation without variation. So if you remove variation, you can't really see the covariate part of it. Um, so we think that might be part of it, but it could also be there's more going on in that region. In any case, when you have a strong specification for the what is happening with the glottis, so the lead and the long line voicing, you get really strong structure across languages. And um, there aren't too many outliers here. I think if I remember this, so that I do have an interactive app that you can play around with and see which point is which language. Um, this could be a Mayan language that may not have a contrast, which I think is really interesting that it would be an outlier so it doesn't have a voice of, actually I don't know what's going on with that one because that is in the lead stop. What is interesting about this data though is when we were working with it and we noticed an outlier, we would go back to the original source and sure enough it's a typo. So um, it was um, made, yeah, so there are very few outliers. Okay, so the meta-analysis approach to studying cross-linguistic phonetic variation has been done by a few before. Um, and of course, there are also analyses using multilingual spoken corpora, but it's been, it's been somewhat limited in the number of languages that can be investigated, just because of data availability. Um, I've had the chance to work recently with the Wilderness Corpus, um, which is a corpus of Bible readings with utterance-level alignments for over 600 spoken languages. Uh, it's about 20 hours of speech per language. Um, the one issue, or there, there are several issues with this corpus as there are when it comes to work with corpora, but um, it tends to be there's only one speaker per corpus, which is not great for phonetics because then you've confounded the vocal tract with the language. Um, nevertheless, it sort of, it is the biggest corpus with the most, di the most diverse representation of languages that we currently us. Um, so I, I do think there's still value to working with this corpus. Um, we have since created the derivative Vox Clementis corpus um, where due to copyright issues, so you can go and download all of these languages um, from, it is collected by missionaries, um, but they do uh, maintain tight copyright control over the recordings, so each researcher has to go and download the recordings themselves to verify the copyright. Um, so what we did is created this derivative, which is a release of many of the phonetic measurements. But getting good phonetic measurements from such a large corpus is um, it's an iterative process of refinement. Um, so we have performed forced alignment on this corpus, uh, which is of course just uh, aligning the transcript to the audio signal using some machine learning tools. Um, the big uh, bottleneck in this type of approach is that um, you need a mapping from the orthographic representation to a canonical, at least a canonical phonetic representation or phonemic sequence. Um, and that only exists, that type of mapping only exists for 50 odd languages. Um, and so some of my more recent research is trying to develop this for more languages. But uh, what has since been developed, there is a system called Unitram, which tries to perform universal G to P. Uh, it's not a great system because it will take segments like orthographic sa, sha, and break it apart as um, the phoneme sa and the phoneme ha, which is, of course, for many languages, not true that sa, sha is a digraph that should be pronounced as sha. So Unitram is not great, but it allows us to perform some alignment. Basically, we threw out everything that was aligned with Unitram. The other two G to P systems that we, or toolkits that we've been using are Wikipon and Epitran, which have language specific G to P support. Um, Wikipon basically is a G to P mod, uh, 
will scrape Wikipedia pronunciations for words so that you have the mapping from the orthography to the phoneme sequence. And then you can train a, like a neural network or some type of model to predict the phonemic representation from the orthographic representation, but still maybe not as precise as a linguist might want. Evitran, though, is um, a bunch of rule-based systems, uh, and this works very well when a language has a fairly opaque or thought, or sorry, uh, transparent orthography, where you can just write a rule-based system that will convert the orthography into um, the phonemic sequence. So we're just going to rely on Wikipon and Epitran, call those are high-quality languages. We have coverage for about 42 languages right now. Again, we're working on building more resources to get more coverage. Um, and then we extracted phonetic measures from the phone level alignments. So when we look at the sibilant mid-frequency peak across languages, we get a really similar picture to what we saw for American English and separately for Czech. Um, so unfortunately for sibilants, uh, there were only, of the 42 languages we had, only about 18 languages were represented as having both S and S which might make sense when you think about the frequency of sub, that not every language is going to have that. Um, but we do still have some variation in the language families represented, and we still see that strong co-variation across languages. Um, and this is all automatic processing. Um, we do need to go back in and clean it up some more, but it is reassuring that, okay, maybe there's something to a universal constraint, maybe not necessarily a categorical constraint, but some influence Cross linguistically saying, you know, whatever your, if the two segments share a phonological feature specification or share some natural class structure, then the phonetic target corresponding to that phonological representation should be the same. Not only within a language, but across languages. Or sorry, not across, sorry, but take, I take that back. It should be the same within a language. It can vary across languages, which is where we get the cross linguistic variation. Um, we also happen to look at vowel height as uh, measured by F1. Um, and so here we've got F1 of E and F1 of U. And of course, those are the phonological features of vowels may not be as nice to work with as those with obstruents for this uh, pursuit. We need to see what's going on with vowels some more, but at least for F1 and vowel height. So we've got plus high vowels, which might correspond to a similar height feature. We are also seeing reasonably strong correlations across languages um, of the mean uh, F1s for them. Okay, so this has also sort of been studied. So Lucia Menard's group has also looked at this a bit with A and O. I think Don Watt has some evidence that's similar with A and O in Yorkshire English, though it, he doesn't talk about it in this way. Uh, Livio Oshiro has looked at this. They've observed this correlation of vowel height, um, but I think there's more to be said about the fact that there is a correlation. I think it's showing something else about how natural class structure is then projected into phonetics as well. Okay, so the emergent picture is that there is strong evidence for target uniformity, um, especially among obstruents. That's where most of my research has been focused this far, thus far, and possibly to some degree among vowels, at least with the F1 findings. There's weaker evidence for contrast and pattern uniformity, though its influence may not be entirely non-existent. There could be some pressure to sort of conform to the population standards um, and make things similar. That said, yeah, the evidence is weaker. We have computationally formalized target uniformity via factor analysis. I won't go into this here, but there is a slightly better way of modeling, say, like a latent variable that would represent the phonological feature. And we've also examined the strength of target contrast and of pattern uniformity by modeling these as Bayesian priors on a generative model of phonetic realization. This generative model of phonetic realization is just a linear regression. Okay, so it's just taking the phonological features and predicting the phonetic output. Okay, so it makes it, I don't want it to, Sometimes these fancy things are really things you already know. Okay, so, um, so other constraints that could be related to uniformity or sort of at odds with uniformity would be ones like perceptual distinctiveness or phonetic dispersion, which says that speech sounds should be maximally distinct from each other, or at least sufficiently distinct. Um, so I think we need a little bit, so uniformity actually 
says make things more similar, not distinct. So I think we could go back to phonetic dispersion for sexual distinctiveness and perhaps refine it to say something like, well, make things distinct along certain dimensions. Uh, so contrasting features, and perhaps someone has already gone through and defined it that way. But I think um, we could now that we have this idea of uniformity more explicitly stated, I think it's always been assumed, but not explicitly stated. But as soon as we commit to uniformity, then perhaps we can clean up some of our statements about phonetic dispersion and distinctiveness. The other thing that uniformity does for us is it reveals a need for something akin to natu natural class structure in phonetic representation. Okay, so phonetic representation does still hold on to a lot of the natural class structure that is present in phonology. Okay, so of course sociolinguistics is going to come in and say, you know, play around with some of these targets, but that's going to be constrained to some degree by uh, the phonological representation. Okay, so this goes straight into the next point of bricolage. Um, so of course, from the beginning of the talk, speakers have, so it's been claimed speakers can construct their social identity by picking and choosing expressions of phonetic variables. Yes, but only to some degree, okay? So once you choose your target for S, you've automatically chosen your target for Z, okay? So you, it's not a total free for all. Um, I'm not, so bricolage is probably definitely, it's definitely there, but it's, uh, we need to put some constraints on it. Um, other implications of uniformity, um, perceptual adaptation. So again, going back to the beginning of the talk, phonetic code variation, whatever structure is there, could be used in rapid adaptation to novel talkers. So again, if you know what, if you've heard this person say so, you hear the S, well, now you can start filling in other parts. You can start making predictions about what their other speech sounds would sound like. Well, in particular, they see. And it might also have implications for sound change. So there is a tendency for natural class to shift in parallel over time. And it could be that, you know, as S starts drifting in one direction, well, Z is going to be dragged along with it. Uh, and there might be other instances where you might get sound change in one segment and strangely it pulls another segment along with it. Now, I think some of the vowel cases of sound change might be more complicated than just a featural change, but I know Joe Fruwald has some nice work showing that, you know, these vowels tend to move together as a class. So that's done with Philadelphia. Um, and so in general, this constrained variation and uniformity has important implications for phonetic theory, phonological theory, perceptual adaptation. And the other thing I want to highlight is that these large scale corpus approaches provide us the opportunity to analyze the extent and limits of phonetic variation across languages and talkers. Um, so so we, we can start to look into questions of just how universal are some of these constraints, or is it language specific? Um, and then there are several feasible extensions of this research in language acquisition, bilingualism, speech perception, and so forth. Okay, so thank you very much for your time and attention, and thank you to my many collaborators for their work to parts of this talk. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Great data, too, for so many examples. So what I would like to do is just um, ask questions first in this room, and I would like to give the word first to our master and PhD students, maybe that's a simpler question or comprehension question than the other people in the room, and then finally we move to the Zoom and see if there are questions there as well. I think Ricardo had a question. I want to start. Hi, I'm Ricardo. Um, my question is actually in two parts. Uh, uh, the first part is this, at the start of with, and setting up the background to your talk, uh, you describe the modular feedforward architecture of grammar mm -hmm. as a, a traditional model that is controversial in some respects. Yeah. Uh, but I take your conclusion to be saying, actually, we found empirical evidence for the um, role of features as inputs to phonetic implementation mm -hmm. in such an architecture. Uh, so the first part is just checking that that's what you're saying. And the second part would be, well, if that's the case, um, what do you think is going on in the diachronic development of gaps? So for example, when you have a, a series of segments uh, mm -hmm. that share a specification, say in the case of English, um, P, D, K, but uh, going to those non-aspirated uh, allophones, um, 
T in American English yeah. becomes flat. So, mm -hmm. so it, it moves out of the series in some way. Yeah. So what do you have to say about phonetic implementation to simultaneously capture phonetic uniformity, which is empirically real, as you've shown, yeah. but at the same time, you allow gaps to happen? Because right. presumably they, they start Yeah. So it would be here. nice to take this to the next level below the phonological surface segment and look at allophonic variation and how it speaks to allophonic variation. But of course, the big challenge there is, well, yeah, segments like T tend to behave out of their class. Um, so we have cheated so far and just looked at the phonological surface segment mapping. So whichever it is the flap, then it has a certain set of features. And if it's the aspirated form, it has another set. Um, I do think that does need to be accounted for, but perhaps, I mean, I'm just thinking off the top of my head here, perhaps it does show a greater separation between the phonetics and the phonological part, that the phonetic realization doesn't actually speak to how much power the phonology has in variation. Um, but I need to think about that a bit more. It is a direction we, I would like to go in, but I haven't had as much time to think through it. If you have any suggestions, I'm all ears. Um, but yeah, I think when it comes to gaps, it, the fact that the crux of this argument really just relies on there being shared features and not necessarily a complete set of those features. So I, I, when I first heard gap, I was thinking we maybe pataka ba da, but ga is missing. Um, and I don't think it really speaks to that missing place of articulation. But the case of T is interesting. Yeah. I do think T is special in a lot of these cases. If you might let me follow up mm -hmm. briefly. I'm interested in, uh, I, I mean, the, 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 the notion of gap is not important. What's important is that, for instance, in, in, you know, you start with the, the, the mm -hmm. and then the is on its way out. Uh, you start with a situation historically where mm -hmm. all three of them share the same uh, specification, Laryngeal specification, mm -hmm. should something, assuming that some change starts gradiently and only later becomes categorical, something has to happen first in the phonetic implementation module to enable the G to start behaving gradiently differently before it's... Yeah, it gets so target. actually this makes me think about, okay, well, uniformity is just one set of constraints that, or just maybe even just one constraint that's operating on the phonetics, on this phonetic realization. Um, and perhaps we do need to start looking at like coming up with good definitions of articulatory needs and uh, perceptual distinctiveness to start accounting for, okay, what happens when a segment diachronically breaks from its natural class? Is it an artifact of articulatory ease? The issue so far with articulatory ease is that I don't think it's been like given a clear or stable definition for us to test this, but perhaps if we commit to something, we can start modeling the interactions between these constraints. Right. Uh, yeah, I just wanted, first I wanted to say this is very interesting, very persuasive, but I kind of also have a question about phonological features. And mm -hmm. specifically, I'm curious about why you think it's abstract features that are behind phonetic uniformity. So why not something less abstract, like uh, we're using the same articulatory routines? Well, some people say that this phonology, but it's a different Yeah, language. yeah, so... I think it would still work out if you assume it's just articulatory routines. Um, what I think is less appealing about that approach is that it's sort of ignoring the natural class structure that you're getting from it. Um, now it's possible like if you do commit to it being a phonological representation, you could say, well, when you have this laryngeal gesture that is reused, um, then whichever segments are specified with that laryngeal gesture form a class. Um, the other issue with the gestural approach is that you need to start having some pretty complex gestures. Like with VOT, it's not just the uh, glottal spreading. It's also the glottal spreading and its relationship to the constriction location which is going to vary by place of articulation. 
Um, so then the like representation becomes perhaps a little bit more abstract. So it's like the timing of the glottal spreading to P, to the bilingual constriction, the timing of the glottal uh, spreading to the tongue tip constriction, the timing of the glottal spe uh, spreading to the dorsal constriction of the patient. And then it's just, I mean, you can work it out that way. It would be equivalent, I think. It's just um, less satisfying in terms of its simplicity, if that makes sense. But I think it would be equivalent if you defined it in that way. But yeah, I think there is something you buy by just saying it's a plus X feature that's shared and it has a certain set of phonetic targets. And that also happens, of course, that also gives us access into the phonological part of the grammar that we can now start looking at things like allophonic variation and how this interacts. So it gives us that connecting point of like, these segments are not independent things. They've got an abstract relationship and that abstract relationship is carried from the phonology into the phonetics or vice versa. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, no, I mean, I think it's, 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 uh, I think it makes sense. And I guess in a way that needn't be necessarily mutually exclusive because you can express it like you say, sort of like in simple terms as a shared property. Yeah. And like in articulated phonology, like what people already think that it could be like, you know, you could lose the same phasing relationship or something like this. So mm -hmm. it just uh, it could be just a different way of thinking about it. Yeah, I think it is. So I'm. I think it is equivalent at the end of the day, whether you want to collapse the phonological representation with the phonetic one, but I think you might, in terms of its predictive power, you could potentially lose some predictions about the phonology, or perhaps it is the way to go. It's just to say it's all gestural. That said, I think there is also reason to believe that there is some perceptual component of the targets based on what we know about auditory feedback and how speakers will adjust their articulation based on the auditory feedback. Um, so any sort of perturbation in the audition. But so so that's another reason why I've sort of stayed away from a pure motor gesturalist explanation. It's just I think it's a little bit more complex, but I think there is some equivalence at the end of the day. That's like the thing for S should be the same as the thing for C. And yeah. The set for S should be the same as the set for Z along this dimension. Yes. Sorry, if I may. Um, yeah. Talking about an anatomy and, 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 and possible physical explanations, um, I wonder if this difference in the magnitude of the correlation between vowels and consonants mm -hmm. uh, doesn't point towards something like a role for frontal effects in the sense that um, uh, the, 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 the relationship between uh, uh, articulate variation and, mm -hmm. and acoustic output is much more non-linear in the case of, of uh, at yeah. least certain consonantal features than it is for vowels. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, I wonder if, if then, you know, we're crediting to, to features some explanatory role that actually begins to those frontal effects. So would the idea be like, if we, could, if we measured vowel articulation instead of the acoustic, so look at the articulation directly, that that might be a no, better... No, it's rather the quantum effects constrain the range of, of variation for certain yeah. features more than others. Oh, so well, so, so the, yeah. the range of variation for place of articulation, for example, for sibilance, because there's, there's such a nonlinear relationship between uh, actual articulation and acoustic output for, for those coronal mm -hmm. fricatives, then the quantum effect is actually constraining the range of variation for the coronal plus minus anterior yeah. Uh, features in a way that it does not plus minus oh, high. I see. So yeah. So there's a limited. So there is variation, but that variation is limited within a certain range. Whereas that variation is not as limited on vowels. Yeah. yeah. That very well could be and probably is likely to be true. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. Moving over to vowels is going to be interesting. I don't know whether it's that our phonological feature set is not as good for vowels as it is for obstruents, or if it's if we're running into other issues, or if uniformity may not apply as strongly to vowels as it does to obstruents. But yeah. I, I think my problem with vowels is that you just can't tell what vowels, sorry, what features are right by looking at the inventory. You have to, I, I mean, Pulsma has shown this very well, you know, you, mm -hmm. have, you can have the same five-hour inventory with 
completely different user structure. I see. Okay, so uh, yes, I will have to look into that as I move into balanced territory, which I don't as as of yet not avoided. <laughs> Nicely situated with the obstruents. <laughs> Yeah. It's been a long time that I've done any phonetics, like I was undergraduate, but I actually found this very interesting. Thank you. And my question is a bit similar to Ricardo's. Um, if you keep sort of distances, um, targets constant, mm -hmm. how do you ever get merger? Or would that be yeah, and this is where across different. Yeah, um, I mean, this gets some. into the idea like it relates to the gaps and also, uh, oh my. It's just died. Um, so mergers, and specifically, I mean, I guess you could have mergers with constants as well. Um, I would need to think about the diachronic process a little bit more. So what's going on there? Um, so around mergers. Yeah, it could just be that there are other constraints at play that really come through diachronically. And of course, like there are perceptual, there might be perceptual motivations um, that even though, because the other thing with uniformity is it's actually saying they think more similar. Uh, and that actually goes, um, that could actually result in a merger of vowels if they're more similar along this dimension and that interacts with some way with perceptual distinctiveness so that the contrasting feature uh, between two vowels is suddenly not as salient phonetically and then all of a sudden you've just got two vowels coming together along the uniform dimension. It would need to be played out I think but I think it, it is inspiring me to start looking at trying to formalize these additional constraints that are frequently argued to operate on phonetic realization and, and modeling the interactions between them because I do think that could be mergers and gaps could be a case where uniformity and, dis and phonetic distinctiveness and possibly also articulatory ease just all form a perfect storm um, and so you might get these changes over time but yeah, yeah. You and should... it might be the case that functional load of a particular segment that's kind of specific. Yeah, so there's also the yeah, the functional load aspect and how it works with phonological neighborhood density and all the additional effects that contribute to a speech sound being contrastive um, in a phonetic space. Um, so I think there's a lot of future work going that could be done there um, to really see, okay, how do these all interact with each other? And could it be that the fact that uniformity is saying, okay, add, add, should have the same frontness value. And then the uh, height feature start, the height contrast starts to sort of become less perceptually distinct. Well, the preserved height, or sorry, the preserved front feature through uniformity strengthens and that just, it just becomes yeah, right? Some, some merge bell between that. Yeah, it, I think it's a really interesting direction to go in. And I need to think about it some more. But yeah, good for thought. Let me see if there are questions on Zoom. So if you have a question on Zoom, just uh, raise your hand. Uh, this doesn't seem to be the case. <laughs> um, I also have a whole set of questions, but um, I'm not a, a politician either, so they might all be a bit silly. But maybe I can, unless there are other people who want to ask the question first, maybe I get to ask the last question. So. So probably maybe it wasn't yeah. speaking it. But so the first graphs you showed were those mid uh, frequency peaks for you know S and Z and those correlate nicely and yeah. and uh and sure and those correlate mm -hmm. and then you showed the second set of graphs where the correlations were broken. Yeah. But the measurements mm -hmm. were the same, those were also the mid frequency peaks. Yeah, it was the mid frequency peak. Um so it's the same mm -hmm. measurement but taken from um but just swapping the relationship. So then I thought, uh, so not so surprising that the frequency would be, that the correlation would be broken. Perhaps this mid-frequency peak is an indication of something like base of 
articulation something similar. Mm -hmm. And if you had measured something else, say some measure of voice or something, you would have found the same correlations, which if you then had yes. plotted them inversely, you would have broken the correlation yeah. again. So exactly. No. Just, so yeah. that was actually the point. Um, so that we do want a acoustic correlate that will tap into the phonetic target. And this is getting back a bit to what Pat was saying, or um, suggesting that you know some some theories posit that the phonetic targets are the phonological representation. Um, which yeah. So if we had looked at a say the duration of the fricative, which is a better indicator of say phonological voice, mm -hmm. then yes, we would expect sa and sh to be correlated, and I believe they are. And za and sha to be correlated, but not so much between sa and za. And that's exactly what we predict. So there, but what we're doing is taking the phonological specification of, in this case that I presented here, plus anterior, which suggests that there should be something going on with place of articulation, but it doesn't say anything precise about what should be going on with place of articulation. The other issue that has been raised by people like Pino uh, uh, Volanets and Charles Rees is that there can actually be a lot of what they call intrasegmental co-articulation. So the fact that plus anterior um, for S is also in the presence of minus voice, minus voice could influence the phonetic realization of plus anterior in a way that plus and plus voice could have a different influence on plus anterior, giving rise to a slight separation. Um, and this actually, like, you do get some cases of intrasegmental co-articulation. What this is showing, though, is at least for this dimension of looking at a phonetic correlate to phonetic place of articulation, actually does reveal that plus anterior really, the phonological underspecified feature of plus anterior, I mean, underspecified in terms of its phonetic specification, that still calls the shots in terms of its phonetic realization. Voice has very little influence on what you do with anterior. Okay, so it's showing that these two distinctive features are very, are very independent of one another. Alternatively, another way of thinking about it is that the features can mix together um, and have sort of combine and create their own articulation or their own set of phonetic targets, in which case some might look entirely different from some just because of the combination of phonetic targets. But what we're showing is sort of this orthogonality. It does feel a bit circular, but I do think there's something that, because we say that the phonological representation doesn't specify exactly the phonetic realization, and the fact that the phonological representation plus anterior is in the presence of all these other features that are not necessarily the same, um, then there is something special about seeing that feature shining through into the um, phonetic instantiation. So what we observe from phonetics. But yeah, no, you're exactly right. If we had chosen a feature, a correlate that represented like dur duration, yeah, the correlation would be the other direction. I'm just confused because I thought you used that as evidence of weak evidence for contra um, Contrast uniformity. Yes. So yeah, so it's always about the feature target pairing. Um, so the core, the predictions are going to be different for every pairing of the feature to a set of, of to a phonetic target. So we, in this case, we were looking at the pairing of the anterior feature with the constriction, like a constriction location target. We could also look at a pairing of anterior with the uh, glottal spreading gesture. But target uniformity would suggest that both glottal, glottal spreading is not dominated by and the anterior feature. Glottal spreading is actually dominated by the voice feature. So anteriority should not have, has, should have very little influence on what you do with voice Okay, so, so it's sort of coming up with a representation as to which features get to call, the which phonological features get to call the shots in the phonetic specification. Does that make sense? Uh, it does. Okay. It's so much. The, yeah, it's a lot. Of stuff, but, like, I'm still working through it myself. Yeah. Well, I still thought that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for this talk. I suggest you stop it here and continue the discussion in the common room. So let's end our speaker again.